Hello and welcome to Rapid Flow. My name is Eric. I'm the founder. I'm a trained sound engineer. And in this video, I'm going to share with you 10 principles that it's great to know and understand if you want to mix music like a pro, if you want to make sure that you have all the tools available in your arsenal to get professional results. So today we're going to be looking at gain staging. We're going to be looking at VU metering versus peak metering. We're going to be looking at LUFS metering. We're going to be looking at transients and sustains um, parts of signals. We're going to be looking at compression and limiting. We're going to be looking at saturation and clipping. And we're going to be looking at equalization. And you know, what does it all mean with low pass, high cut, uh, band pass, all that kind of stuff we're looking at. We're going to be looking at stereo spacing uh, and panning. And of course, we're going to have also a quick touch on reverb and delay. So these are the basic essential tools that you need as a sound engineer. We're going to try to get through these as quick as possible to give you an understanding of what each of them does, how you can use them for your music. And I'm going to show you this with real world examples inside Ableton. Uh, but this applies to any DAW and you can do it with many different plugins. So let's get started uh, on the very first thing. Uh, let's have a look at gain staging. So what you're looking at here is uh, a template uh, that I make uh, called the Rapid Flow template. Um, and this is something that I picked up um, over the years, which is the importance of not having your individual signals super loud going towards your master bus. Now, if I play this track for you, uh, let me bring up the kick and bass, etc. Do you see that the kick drum is peaking at, what is it, minus 15 in the channel when I have it all the way up? Um, that means that I'm basically sending this kick drum to the master bus at minus 15 dB full scale. And people ask me initially, like, man, this is really low compared to what I usually have. Well, that's exactly the reason or the way that you can get things to sound much, much better is not sending stuff way too hot into plugins, especially plugins that do analog modeling. Uh, because most devices like an LA-2A 1176, but a whole bunch of things were designed and calibrated to work at zero dB VU. We're gonna look at that in a second. Um, and if you are sending signal into one of these model devices, way beyond that, it's not gonna sound as good as it can do. And over the years, I've also learned that DAWs tend to sound better, uh, in my experience, when you build up the gain increasingly towards your master bus. And the extra benefit of this also is that when you remove, in this case, the mastering chain that I'm using, you have a mix down file that still has like tend to be full scale of headroom. So you can send it to a mastering engineer and they'll have lots of space to work with it. And uh, yeah, won't have like a super squished, uh, very, very loud uh, mix down. So first tip right here, uh, I would recommend you to have your either when if you have your fader at zero, then just check that the level inside your channel is around minus 15 dB full scale. That's what you're seeing right there. And uh, if you are mixing everything from that point, your whole track will fit together really nicely and you'll have lots of space left over for your um, mastering chain. So let me remove my mastering chain and show you how much space is left when you start your mix with your kick drum at that level. So as you can see now here on my mastering uh, on my master bus, I still have 14 dB of headroom left. And that's basically all gain that I'm grabbing in my mastering chain to boost things up. Uh, yeah, huge, huge hack, and I highly recommend you experiment with this. Now, in order to understand all this in a bit more detail, we need to discuss uh, metering quickly. Um, and uh, there's a couple of different variations of metering that you should be aware of. Um, sort of, you know, the classic, what everything started with were so-called VU meters. Uh, let me show you an example of that so that you can see what that looks like. Uh, there's a really great one from uh, Klanghelm um, that a lot of people use. Uh, this is a VU meter. And yeah, basically this is what it all started with. If you're seeing levels around zero, that's what most of these old devices and many plugins uh, that emulate them were calibrated to. So let's have a look. So 
this VU meter is early in my mastering chain. It's before my clipper, it's before my bus compressor and my limiters, which is how you can see the only thing that's really hitting it, this console one isn't on really, uh, or it's not doing anything, is uh, it's, uh, it's getting a bit of EQ, my uh, mix down, and it's getting this OTT. And after the OTT, I have the VU meter uh, inserted, and as you can see, with calibration to minus 18 dB, full scale, it's hovering right around zero. And that means that if I insert some, uh, you know, physically modeled or, or some modeled device after this, uh, it's going to be getting signal just where it expects it and you can boost it up really nicely. Um, so the other kind of metering is um, full scale peak metering. And this is sort of, you know, the digital age uh, where um, things change from VU meters to full scale metering. The best place to see this is on your master. Um, so right now, because I have this filter engaged here on my remote control here, let me show you. I have everything mapped there in my um, template. Um, I am now seeing a, a full scale level of minus five with the filter down, but let me open the filter and show you. I'm just hitting like zero minus 0 0.2 decibels full scale on my output meter, which is, you know, it's, it's as loud as you can go. If you go beyond that, you start to get into clipping territory, uh, which on your master I wouldn't recommend unless you have some uh, plugins dedicated to that or expensive converters that can handle that well. Um, so if I were to remove these limiters, you will see that now again, I have tons of headroom. So, um, this is the full scale levels and uh, they show you in a digital audio workstation like Ableton, but this applies to any DAW, how much you have left before you start to clip. So let me show you what clipping sounds like and why we usually try to avoid it uh, on the master bus. So if your meters look like that while you're producing, that's probably not a good idea. So it just starts to sound distorted. In essence, what's happening is the waveforms that are being sampled by the digital processes don't have the space to you know, nicely be captured, but they basically get chopped off and hard cut at the end, hard clipped. Um, and it starts to sound like a square wave and that's distortion. So there you go with your um, full scale metering, but there is a third kind of metering that is very important for you to understand and know as a musician or producer sound engineer, and that is LUFS metering. LUFS is a loudness unit, uh, full scale, which is something that's a little more recent. And it was basically something that uh, people came up with in order to have um, a loudness level that can be more easily compared to each other. It comes from broadcast. And the cool thing is that there is a freeware plugin that you're seeing right now, Yulian Loudness Meter, which shows you uh, LUFS. And the one to look for is the integrated LUFS. Uh, you can reset it here. And if your integrated LUFS is sort of between, let's say, minus 10 and minus 8 on your final master, you're going to be roughly where most people these days uh, do their mixes or their masters. Some people do them way louder, but I would recommend you not to do that. I'll talk about that a bit more. So as you can see, this mix is actually peaking at yeah, around minus seven. As you see, it's going down now. It, it shifts over time because it's taking an average of what's going on. And this is a really important um, number to know about your tracks and your mixes and the way to get things to sound loud and punchy like this and, and this is one of the key things we're going to look at in the second EQing is not to have too much low end if your kick and your bass have tons of low end getting things loud like this is really really hard because uh, low end absorbs a lot of um, the space available to get things loud um, and it's an important thing to know is that there's a big difference between peak metering VU metering and LUFS metering Peak metering just shows you the very loudest part of your audio signal. VU metering is already more adapted to the way we hear it as people. It's kind of more smoothed out and average. Um, and then LUFS metering is really taking that kind of to a more scientific level where there's a way they calculate how loud the signal is. If you have a track that has tons of peak, very high peak information, but a relatively low VU or LUFS 
kind of level so it's not it's not dense but it's like very peaky with a lot of very hard snare hits and maybe a very big kick drum it will be very difficult to get that loud which is where clipping comes in what we're going to look at in a little second and also EQing so if your track has an average loudness that is high without massive peaks above it you'll be able to grab that whole track stick it in a compressor or limiter and raise the overall perceived loudness much higher than if you have very loud peaks sticking out of it that your compressor or limiter are trying to tame and then the source the material underneath it won't be able to come up that high so the goal is to have a punchy dynamic mix but having the illusion of a loud mix without having massive peaks because those are very hard to get loud okay moving along and uh, yeah i started speaking about it just now which is uh, the difference in transients and the sustained part of an audio signal so as I said, if your track has very loud transients and a really great way to show that is with snare drums. Let me open uh, uh, the snare of this track here. Um, snares tend to have a very strong transient. You want some of it, but if there's too much of it, it's going to make it hard to sound loud. Okay, so what does it sound like if we add transients to this snare just to give you an idea of what transients sound like? I'm going to use... Um, this uh, plugin from console one from Softube, and just so you understand that you know how sounds have an envelope I'm sure if you make music you know there's an attack a decay a sustain and a release phase um, the transient is the very crest of the sound it's the very beginning of a sound like the second uh, pick maybe hits a string or some synthesizer plucks have a transient sound so let me show you what a transient sounds like if it's very exaggerated uh, I'm using the console one plugin from Softube here So that punch parameter makes the crest, the leading crest of the audio wave more pronounced, but you can also uh, manipulate the sustain six part of a signal. And what you're basically looking for as a sound engineer is a good balance between something that still feels punchy but doesn't have massive peaks, uh, but and also has a nice sustained part of the waveform so that it feels up close and personal and really present and in your face. So a tool like this or SPL's Transient Designer, there's many different tools, uh, is a really great way to influence that. But there are other ways also. So having discussed Transient and Sustain now, let's chat about uh, compression and limiting. Uh, I'm sure that if you make music you've heard of compressors. In essence what they do is allow you to uh, automatically control the dynamics of a sound so you can squeeze down on a sound so that it doesn't get so loud and cause these very high transients that I was just showing you. Uh, so let me put uh, a compressor on this. I usually use the glue compressor. I think that that's a, a very good sounding one. Uh, and let's start to compress this snare a bit. I'm gonna teach you a little trick uh, how you can set a compressor really easy, really quickly. Uh, set your attack to very fast, your attack not to automatic, but to slow, ratio very high. And now we're gonna sync this compressor into that snare. Let's have a listen, let me bypass console one. Okay. Okay, so now the uh, compressor is active and because we've tuned it like this, we are now able to hear very clearly what the compressor is going to do. So the way we're going to set the parameters of the compressor is uh, using the formula ARRT, ART, Attack, Release, Ratio and Threshold. That's the order of things that we're going to change. Big, big thanks here to Paul Stavrou who has this technique in his... Uh, Mixing with your mind book, which is incredible. Uh, I'll put it in the description. Uh, this is where I learned this from. So let me show you uh, what happens when you start to affect the parameters in that way. So I'm going to start uh, making the attack phase a bit slower so it lets through more of the transient. You hear the difference? So now what I'm going to do is look for a place where it feels like it sounds right for this snare. So I think 10 milliseconds sounds good. Now I'm going to work on the release phase.
That sounds nice. I'm just going to check my ratio if it can be uh, needs to be lower or if it's good at 10. I actually like it better on two. And with this plugin, changing the ratio also changes the way that it uh, responds. So just do this by ear, but I hope that you realize how easy it is to hear what the compressor is doing exactly. And finally, I'm just gonna check the threshold to see if that can be optimized. Uh, I'm seeing I'm cutting about one and a half two dB. So I'm just going to give this one and a half dB. I'm going to do a bypass and do a final check if this is actually making a positive change or if this is making an improvement. It's just clamping down nicely on the snare and uh, getting it a bit more controlled and a little bit more present uh, without necessarily being louder. So that is uh, generally the way you would use compressors, uh, very often found on anything that's percussive, basses, uh, and slower attack and release compressors are of course found on pads and vocals and things like that. LA-2A on a vocal is kind of a standard. So um, the other thing that I want to show you is limiting. Um, and that is basically a compressor with a very hard knee, so the point where it starts to affect the signal, and a ratio of infinity to one. So anything that goes over the knee uh, gets squished immediately and completely stopped. Here right now I'm using a ratio of one to two, so anything that goes over the threshold of the compressor only gets 50% through. And if I'm doing one to 10, only 10% of that signal is getting through. So one to 10 is almost like a limiter, but let's go to a proper limiter, which will be uh, the one from Ableton to show you this quickly. Here we are on the master uh, chain of my template. By the way, this is the Rapid Flow template. Uh, this has all this already basically done for you. So if you want to make tracks way, way faster, I highly recommend getting this. But anyway, little plug. Uh, I am actually giving away this mastering chain for free. Um, it was my birthday yesterday and I decided to just share something uh, back with the community so you can download this master chain for free. Use the code birthday on checkout uh, and it's all yours. Uh, so you can actually see exactly what I've done here if you're on Ableton, Bitwig, FL Studio, or Logic. Okay, so back to matters at hand, the limiters. Uh, as you can see, I'm using two. And this is uh, a really good trick, which is not to do everything, all the heavy lifting, with just one limiter, but spreading it out over multiple limiters. I often also use limiters, and you will find them in the template, on the individual channels, because it's easier for limiters to work on certain parts of the signal than to try to make everything loud if they have to uh, fight the bass, the kick, the snare, and, and the vocals maybe. So I'm using two in the in the master output to make sure that um, not one limiter has to do too much, which is then much easier to hear. So sh let me show you what that sounds like. Let me show you now what would happen if I tried to make this super loud using just one limiter, and I'm going to bring up uh, the metering again so you can see the integrated loofs. Uh, this is the one you want to look for and I'm going to try to see how loud I can get this with just one limiter before it starts to sound horrible. Like that's already at the edge of what I think is still acceptable and as you can see we're nowhere near the sort of seven and a half loofs minus seven and a half loofs that we were before. So let's do this now with two limiters. So the first limiter right now I'm running it uh, is getting it to sort of minus nine and when I add the second limiter you'll see the level jump but it still sounds clean and punchy.
So what limiters are doing in essence is the signal that's coming in is they're shaving off all the stuff that's jumping out too much uh, and then pulling up all the signal underneath it so everything feels more loud and present and even and in your face. Now a lot of people ask me what level should I be mixing to? How loud should my track be? And I would recommend you to be somewhere sort of around my, somewhere between minus 8 and minus 10 dB LUFs. I know Spotify and Apple Music and everyone is talking about like minus 14 and whatnot, no peaks above minus 2, but in my experience uh, mixing mastering music and releasing a lot of music in the past also is if your track is mastered to minus 14 LUFs and it comes up on Spotify it's going to sound maybe very nice and clean and dynamic but it's going to be lower in perceived level than the stuff that comes before and after it. Uh, so most people tend to aim for, yeah, minus eight, I think is, is what I usually go for. Also the mastering engineers that I work for, that's what I ask them. Because that I think is a good balance between a clean punchy mix uh, and it'll feel loud on playback systems that are running Spotify or Tidal or Apple Music or anything like that. So that would be my recommendation to you. Now we have further tools in our toolbox to achieve a loud mix that are not uh, the ones I've shown you so far. And that is saturation and clipping. Um, saturation in essence adds um, higher order harmonics to the foundation of the sound that you're working on. I'm going to show you this in a second with bass. Uh, and basically it's distortion, but you can, if you're using a good plugin, it's a kind of distortion that feels pleasant and musical rather than digital clipping distortion, which I showed you at the beginning of this video. Um, clipping is basically chopping off the tops of waveforms really aggressively so that they don't peak too much and that you can get a sound louder. Often used on snares, um, actually some producers prefer to clip their signals rather than limit them too much because what limiting does is it punches a hole in the loudness of your overall signal whenever there's a peak and what clipping does is it just chops that off. So I find a combination of both uh, is ideal. So let me show you first uh, saturation uh, and this is something that many producers struggle with which is getting your bass line to sit nicely in a track. But let's say now that I would like to have this uh, bass line a little bit more present. So I'm going to open up um, Fab Filter Saturn, which is a really amazing uh, plugin for uh, yeah, saturation. And I'm going to use the Magic Mastering preset, which you can find on the V1 preset folder, Mastering, Magic Mastering. This was a great tip from the masterclass from my friend Chelly, also known as Earthling. Thanks, Chelly. Uh, yeah, this thing sounds incredible for basses uh, and kick drums. So let me show you what this can do. All these settings are a bit exaggerated because I want you to be able to hear it very clearly um, on the, yeah, with YouTube compressed audio but I think you get the point now let me show you in the context with everything running in the track tell how the bass becomes much more upfront and present and that's just saturation and there's so many different saturation plugins but this is one that's really nice um, Ableton does have one or most of us have some form or other but there's a reason why Saturn gets used a lot another favorite is a uh, decapitator from sound toys also really nice uh, those are two of kind of the industry standard ones so in this video I just wanted to show you stuff based off of uh, plugins that a lot of people tend to use for this stuff. So um, now you have an idea of uh, what saturation can do for your sounds. So let's have a look at clipping. And a great place uh, to see clipping is on the clipper that our mastering chain has on the master bus. Uh, so Ableton doesn't really have a dedicated clipper, but you can make one. This is uh, what I've done here. Uh, these are the settings. Um, and what this is doing is shaving off signals that pass past a certain point. Uh, so let me show you um, what this is doing. And in order to show that to you more effectively, I'm going to over open Pro L2 because it has a nice uh, waveform display. Um, and I am not going to use any gain or anything on it. This is purely to show you what's happening. And I'm going to uh, play this and show you the peaks with and without the clipper. 
So the Pro L2 waveform display is sitting directly behind the clipper and let me show you what happens when I play the drums, the bass and the toms uh, and when I bring in and out the clipper. As you can see now we have pretty heavy peaks in the signal. Uh, certain sounds are just popping up in these transients way more uh, than other parts of the track. Let me now bring in the clipper. See how the waves here now are lower in uh, peak volume? That's because the clipper is grabbing them and not letting them pass and from here now I'm in a position where I can actually make this track much louder because my compressors and limiters aren't having to fight with those pesky little peaks. Let me show it to you again. So this is like a 3-4 dB difference, but if you do this across a whole bunch of channels, it's going to really add up and make a big, big difference to how loud you can get your final master. So clippers, not to be underestimated, uh, kind of a yeah, secret sauce. Many, many producers use this. Uh, most beginners don't. You tend to use clippers, so if you haven't tried this yet, uh, yeah, definitely give it a shot. Uh, like I said, the, the free mastering chain uh, that we're offering has uh, this clipper in it with the settings. Uh, but there's of course also dedicated clippers, uh, like a really cool one is, it's called Big Clipper, uh, Boss Digital Labs. Okay, so let me show you this now on the snare. The reason why you're not seeing this go to full, uh, full scale is because this metering is inserted before the limiters, as you can see here. So let me show you what happens with the snare if I put a clipper on it. You see how those transients, those peaks are being obliterated? Snare doesn't sound that much different now, does it? So I can do the same uh, with um, our clipper. Let me show you that. You see it's how it's shaving off uh, those transients? So yeah, a really good way to make sure that the peaks that get sent downstream towards your compressors and limiters aren't so excessive uh, that they uh, yeah, basically make your limiters cut big cheese holes into your whole track because it's trying to get everything loud but it's getting way too much transient information. So clipping, yeah, absolutely a, a tool that belongs in every musician, producer, engineer's uh, sound box, toolbox, 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 because um, they're so useful to control dynamics and to get your tracks loud without feeling like they've been compressed or something like that. Okay, so moving along now, equalization. Um, I'm just gonna switch this off and put it back to its old settings. Okay, so equalizers. Uh, let me get rid of this clipper to keep things as simple as possible here on screen. Uh, so nice that these FabFilter plugins are so easily uh, scalable. Okay, so we have a couple of different kinds of equalizers that you should know. And I'm gonna name this in the way that I find them easiest to remember. You have low cut, you have high cut. Some people call them high pass, low pass, but I prefer to just call low cut, high cut, because then I can immediately imagine in my brain what's gonna be happening. This is a low cut filter, and it cuts away the lows, or everything that's below it, as you can hear here. Now, we have the same also uh, for high cut filters. Let me show you that. produce uh, dance music then you'll have heard this on a lot of dance floors the reason why I'm able to do this when I'm speaking is because I have a high cut right here on the super channel the, the performance effects of this template so it's super easy for me uh, to affect uh, the way that the sound comes out of this template here let me show you Yeah, it's really great to do build-ups and all kinds of stuff like that. Let me show you. So, yeah, 
yeah, super powerful tools uh, to be able to use. But generally, EQs, or very often, the original reason why EQs were made is to correct uh, the frequency going in, back in the day to lathes cutting vinyl. And uh, what we use them for these days is uh, yeah, to, to make sure that the sounds that we're mixing fit well together and also don't have components that are annoying. So. Um, low cut and high cut I've shown you. Then there's band um, or bell EQs with which you can boost or cut. Uh, and if you make it very steep, uh, it becomes a, a, a so-called notch filter. And this is a great trick actually, if you wanna make sure that your kick drum uh, doesn't overpower your whole track. If you always have too much bass in your kick drums, just make a notch, look for the fundamental um, and just pull that down. So that's the fundamental of the kick drum. And if I pull it, uh, I'm immediately going to have way less bass without my kick sounding too acute. <laughs> bit of a word of warning on EQs is that uh, they, they do change the phase relationships of your sound, generally speaking, unless you put them to uh, a natural or linear phase in the case of uh, the fat filter EQ, but that will cause a lot of latency. So if you're uh, either playing live or still producing and you need low latency on whatever synths you're playing, uh, changing this to natural phase will cause a lot of latency. But uh, if you're doing steep cuts and bells and things like that on EQs, um, you will introduce phase shift into your sound, so it can also degrade the sound. So my motto with this is as little as possible, as much as necessary. So with this, uh, obviously, you know, you, you can uh, do also uh, like a low uh, uh, shelf uh, and a high shelf. That's the other kind of EQs that are quite common. Uh, let me hello, let me grab this here. So these will just boost frequencies from the point that they're set with some overlap further down. Uh, same here with the low one. It will boost frequencies from that point. Uh, keep going. There's further EQs. There's like tilt EQs, which are actually super useful, but that's uh, more advanced stuff. Um, well, actually, since we're here now, let me show you. It's, it's, it's actually, once you see it, it's so simple. Uh, with a tilt EQ, what you can do is shift your whole signal towards high frequencies or low frequencies at a certain point. And it's actually a really clean, natural way to get things to sound closer to what you need without sounding EQ'd. So tilt filters are also something I can highly, highly recommend. Let's listen to this. <laughs> I think, yeah, dynamic EQs is something for another day. I think if you master this already, you're well on your way. But a, an important thing to know related to EQs is to know how to listen, listen to uh, or listen for resonances that are annoying and that are keeping your track from sounding coherent and nice. So let me uh, grab this EQ and drop it. Actually, let me just solo the bass. Uh, and show you what uh, that kind of a resonance is. Okay, so what I've done now is that I've uh, basically made a, a steep uh, peaking filter uh, and I'm going to look for resonances in this bass line that I can pull out. So that's one. Uh, let me find another one. Now let's hear that with and without. Let me exaggerate it a bit more so it's clearer to hear. So there you have it. That's a, a basic overview of uh, yeah the most important things that uh, EQs are good for. So. Your goal as a musician, producer, sound engineer is to make sure that your sounds find sort of, you know, spaces where they can coexist in a way that they don't all clash but still sound full. And EQs can be really useful tools to sculpt them so they fit well together. But you can do a lot of the work also in the composition part by making sure that, for example, the fundamental of your bass line is not at exactly the same place as your kick drum because that's gonna be very hard to EQ apart. So if your kick is at, let's say, I don't know, 50 hertz, and your bass line is playing sort of around 70, 80 hertz, 
they're not going to clash. Uh, so listen to that and make your life easy by trying to not have too many elements playing in exactly the same range. So the next thing that is super essential to know is uh, stereo spacing. So your the space you have to create your track has a frequency content. It has time as in when elements hit, but it also has a stereo field aspect. And if you have everything in mono, it's going to be very hard to separate things. If you have everything in stereo, it doesn't sound very stereo. And it's again, very hard to separate things. So the trick is having some stuff uh, right down the middle, which obviously, you know, often it's the kick drum, uh, the bass, uh, the lead vocal, uh, but then also panning some stuff out to the sides, maybe your hi-hats and shakers uh, left, right, uh, and your synths uh, maybe in stereo quite far outside. And there's some tricks and tools to do that. Um, so let me show you some of them. I've prepared a few here and a classic is uh, the H3000 on the dual 910s. Let me show you what that sounds like. If I take you over to the metering also on this Gonio meter, you can see that it also the signal gets much, much wider uh, when I engage the H910. Let me show you. Right now it's engaged. Now I've switched it off. So that is a classic tool many people use, but actually the uh, S1 Imager from Waves is also really great for sounds, uh, for synth sounds. Let me show you that one. Let me disengage it, bring it in, and let's start at uh, Unity Width. So that makes things feel way, way wider. Another one, a nice trick is uh, Vitamin, uh, again from Waves, which um, has a master width uh, setting for all the bands. Let me show you that. Cool thing with this is you can keep your lows um, not so wide and your low mids so that you don't get, because uh, yeah, the, the downside of doing this is you can get phase issues where certain sounds disappear if you're listening on one mono speaker or they disappeared from the phantom uh, middle of between your speakers. Uh, so let me show you the uh, vitamin again. But yeah, super nice tool for electronic music production. There are tons and tons and tons of these, uh, but uh, those are some of the ones that I really like to use. So uh, for spreading things out in stereo, those are really great tools. Uh, what actually music producers often do, which is really nice, is if you're recording, uh, let's say, um, a pad or, or some kind of a plucky sound, uh, on an analog synthesizer where it's always gonna sound a little different, record two takes put them above each other and pan one hard left, one hard right, and it'll be super stereo because those sounds are not identical. Uh, some soft synths emulate this kind of behavior, so it may work there also, uh, but especially if you're recording outboard stuff, uh, yeah, that makes it feel much, much wider without any kind of uh, phase problems like these plugins can cause. Um, and yeah, generally speaking about panning, um, make sure that you spread things out in the stereo field in a really great way to listen to that in action is actually old Michael Jackson recordings mixed by Bruce Swedian. He's one of the masters, I think, of, I think it's Billie Jean. If you listen to the way the percussions, vocals, synths, guitars, because it has so many layers, that track, but it feels so clean, punchy. The way that panning is done on that is a bit of a masterpiece. And I'm sure that you know certain tracks that you find very immersive. Next time you listen to it, have a listen to where they've placed things in the stereo field. Um, it's a big part of getting things to feel immersive, but also of separating sounds so they're not all on top of each other. And don't make the mistake of thinking that when you make everything stereo, it's going to sound super wide. In order for something to feel very stereo, you need elements in the mix also that are not stereo, because then you can see in the contrast when something feels wide, when a big wide pad comes in. Uh, okay, moving right along uh, now to reverb. Obviously, uh, 
to discuss reverb, maybe to give you a bit of background, basically reverb is the reflections you would get from a space that you're in when you clap or speak into it. Um, and what plugins do is it, they emulate um, the way a room gives back the sound to you. Uh, and you know, there's many, many different kinds of reverbs. Personally, I think uh, Eventide Black Hole is amazing for synths. I love to use that. I also have uh, the Specular Tempest pedal, which is incredible. I mean, there's so many great ones, but generally speaking, reverbs are used to position sounds in a space so they don't feel so dry and in your face. So I'm going to show you my three absolute favorite reverbs, uh, which is the other part of yeah, mixing is getting a spatial dimension also into your track. Uh, positioning things closer to the speakers, meaning drier or closer to the listener, or further back, uh, which would be uh, using some reverb on it, maybe dampening the highs so that it feels like it's deeper, further back in well, virtual room that you're placing it in. So these are the three reverbs that I can highly recommend uh, after many, many years of experimentation. These are some of the ones that I've come to. Uh, Ultra Reverb from Eventide is amazing for its ambiences, which are really great for uh, drums and percussion. Okay, so let me show you what that sounds like. You can just position things in a room with that without it feeling too dry, but also without it feeling too reverby. Does that really, really well. Uh, now let me show you my favorite vocal reverb, which is uh, from uh, Slate um, Verb Suite Classics. It has basically impulse responses that you can tweak a little bit uh, from a lot of really classic devices. Uh, yeah, like all the kind of everything you would want to have in hardware is there. Uh, Quantec, um, yeah, TC Electronic, um, Lexicon, yeah, it's all there. And it just, it's such a great combination of a very versatile impulse responses, amazing for vocals. I don't have vocals in this template, but uh, yeah, give it a shot in vocals. It's really, really cool. And then for synthesizers, I think, yeah, you can't not go wrong with uh, Black Hole. Again, from Eventide, it's the one that I tend to use on almost every project that I do uh, has uh, this one on it somewhere on synths. So let's go to some synth sounds that we can put this on and I can show it to you. Let me put that snare on it again. Or maybe this tom. Or oh, let's try this harmony. reverb. Um, I've heard actually that there's an update to this which is one that's made for a surround and it, the algorithm is supposed to be even better but I haven't checked it out yet. Uh, but yeah this is a really great one for synths. And then finally of course uh, delays uh, which are used you know heavily in electronic music to get kind of a groove going to get a vibe going uh, and also again to space things out in the stereo field. So let me show you maybe on this lead uh, some of the things you can do with delays, actually the, the template that I have in front of me here has delays on it. So let me switch off these reverbs uh, and let me bring in the delay so you can have a listen. So this is a very popular uh, delay plugin uh, from uh, Valhalla DSP, uh, super amazing. And what I personally like to do with it is put it on dotted eights and uh, have a listen.
that parameter introduces something that's kind of like a reverb also. But yeah, that's a super nice delay. There's also really great ones in Ableton, but uh, I'm, I want to show you another one, which I think is, yeah, uh, really, really a nice one. It's actually from Waves. It's called uh, H delay, is it? Uh, yeah, here we go. So again, I love to use this one on uh, Dotted. Ping pong uh, sort of spreads it out a bit more. Make sure you switch off this analog because it just adds unnecessary noise in my opinion. So those are just two of the delays that I think are super, super nice. And generally, I would recommend you to use delays wherever you need to find like a cool, maybe a groove for your bass if it's feeling a bit stale. I do that a lot. Let me put this Valhalla on uh, my bass track and uh, let me load up a bass and show you uh, what that can add to a track. So yeah, super, super nice to make things feel a bit more groovy or to make things bounce around in the stereo field. Uh, so yeah, I'm sure delays is something that you've used a lot. If not, <laughs> then definitely I would recommend getting into it. Okay, so that's it. Uh, this video has turned out to be pretty long, but this is a crash course in sound engineering. I realized at a certain point how lucky I was to go to a school of audio engineering and learn all this sort of from the ground up. Uh, and yeah, after uh, two decades of uh, working in this field as a live engineer, studio engineer, uh, music producer, um, I realized that uh, trying to figure all this out on your own is tough, especially if the, the resources you have are contradictory and whatnot. And what I've shared with you today is really best practices from someone that uh, did a formal training in this. I'm sure there's going to be comments like, no, 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 it's like this or like that, you know, but uh, as Joe Meek said, if it sounds right, it is right. In any case, now I hope you have a better understanding of the basic tools that are at your disposal. And if you want to dive deeper into all of this, we provide templates over at rapidflow.shop. Okay, so that was it for me today. I hope this video has uh, helped you and uh, I hope I see you on the next video. I'm going to be uh, showing you a video here now on how you can mix with uh, spectrum analyzers. If you're a beginner and you're not entirely sure of what you're doing yet, spectrum analyzers can be a great tool to visualize what it is that you're seeing. Please do hit the subscription uh, if you enjoyed this video and hit the notification bell uh, so that you actually see when we upload our next video and YouTube doesn't just dump a whole bunch of weird sensationalist thumbnails and titles on you. All right, I hope uh, you have a great time in the studio and I'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye.